Good uh, afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, talking to you this afternoon. Um, uh, Neg and, and Azarian and and uh, myself, uh, we're co-presenting this uh, keynote uh, on urban climate research contributions to climate resilience. Uh, I'm uh, uh, a professor emeritus at Monash University. Uh, I'm also uh, currently president of the International Association for Urban Climate. Um, and uh, I'm also wearing the, the hat uh, this afternoon as a lead author of uh, Working Group 2 and uh, as co-chair of Chief Cost Adaptation uh, Task Team. So I'll be talking a little bit about each of those things as we move along. So uh, let me just um, begin by setting a little bit of context. So globally, of course, we all know that the process of urbanisation is continuing at an extraordinary rate. Uh, with more, well, well over 50% of global population uh, of 7 billion urbanized. And by 2050, that will be something more like 68%. And of course, these cities are an extraordinarily important part of the global economy, uh, generating 80% plus of uh, global GDP. So this massive urbanization is coinciding with, of course, the increased reality of climate change. And you know, we see that obviously in the, uh, the observational record uh, with, uh, for example, 2020 pretty much tying with 2016 as the warmest year on record globally. And um, <clears throat> unfortunately, of course, we seem to be easily on track for a warming of at least uh, 1.5 degrees by, by 2040. And so these are, of course, great issues uh, of concern at the moment. And of course, next uh, week we have COP26 in Glasgow. The other thing about uh, this uh, urbanization increasing, uh, uh, coinciding with the increased reality of climate change, of course, is that we all know uh, in our line of work that cities are hotter than natural environments. And this uh, creates a range of, of issues for us all. Um, Cities tend to be located uh, in coastal locations, and they are also located in some of the most climate, climatically vulnerable parts of the world. And so the particular issues uh, lie around heat and water, scarcity, uh, and sometimes too much water, uh, as well as sea level rise. And um, we all know now that uh, the issues of extreme heat are, are going to become particularly critical for a large proportion of city dwellers around the world. And even in our country here in Australia, uh, some of the southern cities are likely to experience days above 50 degrees centigrade by the middle of the century. Now, it's, uh, it's also worth saying that although highly vulnerable, cities do in fact provide some unique opportunities for climate adaptation. But uh, having said that, time is short for applying appropriate strategies. Some of these reasons for opportunity is that, uh, are that uh, for example, concentrations of people in the one place maximizes opportunities for climate mitigation and adaptation, uh, pro therefore providing some opportunities to protect uh, some of the population. For example, through the provision of cooler cities. Uh, somewhat surprising to a lot of people, uh, cities also have a lower per capita greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and uh, so there are opportunities for, for uh, um, uh, reducing global emissions um, in this space too. There are co-benefits for many urban approaches to urban mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and some of these uh, opportunities for heat mitigation uh, can establish, uh, 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 can produce uh, measures to reduce all urban warmth that can provide some critical uh, headroom against now unavoidable uh, climate change. So for, for, for these reasons and others, uh, cities and urban climate have begun to attract increased uh, global interest and concern. But to be fair, there has been a, a lack of engagement uh, with urban climate science until relatively recent times. But I think we as a 
community of urban climate scientists need to seize the initiative with this new momentum. We're seeing a whole range of, of um, opportunities emerging around the globe for the work that we do to become really front and central. And so I'm just going to spend a few moments now talking about uh, some of those opportunities. So let's begin by looking at uh, urban climate as it's now beginning to appear in global climate and environment policy. So there's, there's quite a bit of evidence of the increased relevance of, of urban climate in this space. And we see this particularly in uh, UN IPCC activities. Uh, many of you might remember that we had a Cities IPCC conference in Edmonton uh, back in March 2018. There was a lead up to AR6. And many of us in the urban climate community were involved in that. Um, the special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade identified that cities were one of five key areas of systems transitions uh, that could be identified. Uh, and uh, that is one of the reasons why cities have uh, become a, a key component of, uh, of consideration in, in AR6. And in fact, in uh, AR6 uh, in Working Group 2's assessment that will be released in, I think, February or March of next year, there is one dedicated chapter on uh, cities uh, that uh, has a, a substantial amount of urban climate science. There's a lot of other stuff in there too, but uh, our work as urban climate scientists is, is being very well represented there as it is also in many of the regional chapters. In fact, all regional chapters have been encouraged uh, to have strong urban components. Um, and as you probably will recognize these urban, uh, sorry, these uh, regional chapters, um, I, I think there are about 11 of them representing the major re regions of the world. And so each of these has, has, a, has a, a dedicated section on urban, uh, and a lot of our work in urban climate science is referenced there. So we're getting a lot more exposure. Uh, and uh, this has been emphasized uh, at all of the AR6 lead author meetings that, uh, that urban is, is, is really critical. And finally, in relation to IPCC activities, um, there is talk of a special report on cities that will follow the current um, AR6 assessment um, that will include uh, uh, input from the urban climate science community as well as the International Association for Urban Climate uh, of which I'm a president. Just looking at some of the other uh, UN uh, activities uh, that are of relevance here. Um, so we all know about the uh, sustainable development goals um, and cities are heavily represented across a range of those UN SDGs uh, for 2030. Um, and in, especially in uh, SDG 11, which is uh, sustainable cities and uh, communities. UN Habitat 3's new urban agenda that outlines a, a set of global standards and calls for cooperation and sustainable urban, urban development for all cities, uh, that also has a substantial climate component. But now just moving a little bit uh, more closely to work that I'm involved in uh, with WMO, um, urban climate is becoming a, an important an increasingly important consideration uh, in the activities of WMO. Uh, for example, uh, we and the International Association for Urban Climate uh, have a, an MOU with WMO that, that is uh, supporting increased engagement of the urban climate community uh, in global climate policy, uh, including, for example, in the work of the Global Climate Observing System. Uh, G -cost. So I just want to spend a few moments uh, uh, before I pass over to Negan uh, talking about um, the role of, uh, of urban in, in GCOS. 
and it hasn't had a very strong role there in the past, the Global Climate Observing System, but uh, there is potential for a lot more involvement uh, in the future. But just a few words about GCOS. So it was established uh, um, in 1992 uh, to provide advice to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, on the adequacy of the current global climate observing system and to support observations. So of course, WMO coordinates all of the observations by all of the meteorological agencies around the world. Um, and GCOS was uh, established to help provide some element of coordina uh, coordination uh, to those observations. Uh, GCOS is or uh, was co-sponsored by WMO, by UNIO and UNESCO, and ICSU, which is now uh, the International uh, Science Committee, Committee of Science. So GCOS established three expert panels, uh, and these panels uh, were representing the terrestrial, atmosphere, and ocean domains to define critical observations in each of those domains for characterization of Earth's climate. Uh, so just to give you an example, I mean, obviously in the atmosphere, you've got the temperature, humidity, upper air temperatures, et cetera, et cetera. At the surface, you've got things like albedo and land use, land cover change, and so on and so forth. So over 50 essential climate variables have been identified uh, and are currently monitored and provide very important uh, input to the, the uh, IPCC process. Now, at uh, the Paris Agreement, um, this established the global stock take. COP22 uh, established the global stock take as a tool to track global progress on climate change, including adaptation. Uh, and uh, the global stock take reporting for this global stock take will take place in 2023. So GCOS uh, has an important role in the global stock take and has agreed to produce guidance and best practice for adaptation observations and to identify indicators for adaptation and risk from uh, existing in, uh, and for identify indicators for adaptation and risk from existing and new ECBs. Now, one of the things to note is that virtually none of this has uh, been centered on cities, uh, but that has prompted a lot of work uh, by GCOS uh, recently to try and bring um, elements of cities into the global climate observing system. So I chair uh, something called the GCOS Adaptation Task Team, GATT, uh, that is uh, working for the next 12 months to bring together the available information and maybe look for new information. So we're looking at observations for adaptation. And we're looking at observations of adaptation uh, from existing uh, GCOS variables. And we're also looking at potential new ECVs or essential climate variables to provide information on human adaptation, for example, new observations of adaptation. And one of the things that we're very keen to do is to look at these uh, observations that might be related to uh, cities. Uh, one, for example, that we're considering is tracking green cover in cities uh, as a um, an indicator of how cities are adapting to climate change. So, um, uh, and then, then can, there might also be some other non-physical urban indicators. They may not all be sort of physical or biophysical parameters. They might even be looking, we might even be looking at things like tra tracking national budgets on city adaptation, investment and so on. So um, that's uh, a very exciting, uh, um, opportunity and we are um, currently developing with UN, you know, the UNF, FCC and UNEP uh, some case studies um, and we're actually working on four key sectoral case studies at the moment that will inform the larger process um, and so the ones we're looking at at the moment uh, are, are really ones that are drawn from what are seen as being critical global climate change issues of, of the moment. Uh, observations in support of forest wildfire management, 
observations relating to marine heat waves, and then observations in support of urban fluvial flood risk assessment and management of extreme urban heat. So two of these four case studies are urban related, uh, and they deal with uh, two of the, the critical uh, uh, climate change issues uh, believed to be impacting uh, cities. So just uh, one of the last things I'd like to mention before I pass over to Negan is also to talk about another uh, initiative that we're working on in GCOS uh, called the, the GCOS Surface Reference Network, GSRN. So we have many tens of thousands of observations from around the globe. One of the issues that we have with those observations is that, that we are, are not always uh, um, convinced of the quality of siting, instrumentation, location, and so on. So it's become a priority of GCOS and WMO to begin developing a global network of 200, uh, initially, high quality meteorological stations. So we've been considering a, a lot of issues around the establishment of these reference stations. And one of the things that has come up in the work that we've been doing is the fact that cities, even though they are responsible for a large part of the global population, uh, are almost entirely missing from, from these measurements. Um, indeed, urban contamination of observations has been seen to be uh, avoided at all cost in the past. So there's now widespread acceptance at, at WMO that we've got to find a way of making valid urban me climate measurements within established networks or in a parallel observational network. And so the uh, WMO is in the process of, and GCOS is in the process of engaging with relevant expertise, and some of the relevant expertise is, is in the community that I'm talking with at the moment, to, to identify possible ways forward. So that's uh, uh, what I'd like to just uh, um, leave you with at the moment, and I'll pass over to Negan to pick up from, from that point. All right, thank, thanks a lot, Nigel. I'm gonna try to share my screen now. Um, hopefully you can see that. Um, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm um, Negan Nazarian. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of New South Wales, and I'm also affiliated with the Australian Center of Excellence for Climate Extremes and the City Futures Research Center. And um, Professor Tapper provided a really good uh, introduction and overview of our um, our community, our urban climate communities um, impact and engagement with local and international um, communities. Now I will be um, providing more specific examples of how urban climate research um, contributes to making our cities more resilient and what are the impactful research examples that we see in the field. Um, so in this context, I'll be talking about the contribution of the, the research to creating um, healthy, resilient and climate adaptive cities and bring examples of um, across different scales and, and with engagement of um, different interdisciplinary um, topics um, to, to answer, to achieve this um, objective. So one of the, um, possibly one of the most um, well-known phenomena in our field that is also known by by um, neighboring discipline is the urban heat island um, quantification. It's a, a phenomena where um, cities are known to be hotter than rural surrounding. This um, increasing temperature can go as high as 10 degrees. And in fact, in the last century, we spend a lot of time trying to um, quantify this, um, this phenomenon. And we have studies dating back to 1860s where in London or, or different international cities that the, the um, importance or, or the impact of urban, uh, urban areas to local climate has been quantified. However, um, we recently had a lot of discussions about how um, urban heat island intensity may not be the best or only one value of comparing the city to rural area perhaps is not the best way of uh, coming up with solutions to address urban climate challenges. And um, 
thinking about more broader sense of what are the metrics and, and measures, but more importantly, how do we classify our urban environments? So it's not a simple factor of what happens between a rural surrounding and the city, but also within the city, what kind of urban environment are we talking about? Is it highly dense um, and um, compact and high rises, or um, is it the urban area with like significant um, um, vegetation covers and pervious materials. So the way that the research has evolved is then to look at not only the comparison between urban and rural surroundings, but also looking at the intra-urban um, temperature variabilities so that we can distinguish which one of these is likely to have like higher temperature or heat stress challenges. And in that context, then there are um, specialized data sets that are being developed and standards and classification methods that are being developed where we um, look at um, the, a universally accepted method of classifying at cities. And one of these is uh, what I mentioned, uh, have here, which is called local climate zones. And it's, um, and the nutshell is 17 different classification that tries to look at urban form and fabric. So not only uh, our density, uh, densities of our cities, but also um, surface covers, as well as the anthropogenic heat waves and, and so on. So when we look at why this is important and the reason that there's so much effort going into classifying our cities so that it's not only rural versus urban, but also the like characteristics or more detailed characteristics of our urban environments, then we see this becomes very critical in um, quantifying the temperature in our urban environments. In the plots that I'm showing here, it's indicating that the temperature variability throughout the day or on average can be quite distinct depending on which one of these um, local climate zones you're looking at. So the reason this is important is that then these quantification then inform the cooling strategies that we implement in our cities. If you're if you're thinking about cooling strategies like adding vegetation cover, that's potentially going to have more impact in a compact high rise areas as opposed to let's say open low rise that already has a certain level of vegetation. So being able to look at those um, cooling strategy for mitigation or adaptation, but being um, classifying the city based on more uh, characteristics of um, urban form and fabric is, is a critical avenue for getting um, climate sensitive solutions. And that um, approach has led to an international effort that is called WUDAP, the World Urban Dataset and Access Portal Tools. And it's an internationally um, community generated um, way of coming up with urban information for both observation and modeling and to be able to also facilitate a, a universally accepted uh, method for looking at climate, weather, air quality, and energy use in different cities. So this is an example of the WUDEP um, initiatives where um, local climate zones were obtained for the entire continental Europe. And if you look at smaller cities, then like in here we have Budapest, you see how a city can be um, very different in um, different area, like spatial distribution of your local climate zones um, can vary from natural land cover to suburbia, and then um, um, the highly dense um, urban uh, classifications. And, also, you can see now compar comparison of this with um, different cities. You see the um, the variability, spatial variability that is seen across different cities. So there's two cities that might be um, considered in a similar density may have very different spatial distribution of their local climate zones. In fact, um, these. Efforts have then led in the with that project to create a, a tool, an open access tool for everyone called LCZ Generator, where now there's this initiative to use the satellite data and the machine learning um, that is embedded in this tool to be able to create LCZ maps globally. So I showed you Europe, but this effort is extending to um, the global major cities where like anyone in the community is able to create these uh, training areas and develop their LCC maps. So we talked about the, um, the difference in inter-urban variabilities and I have a, um, a map on, um, la uh, on right, the visualization on right that is showing that um, 
that urban airflow, similar to temperature, is highly variable in our cities. And um, these are micro scale simulations we've been doing in our labs. So being able to represent that then at the mesoscale can similarly benefit from local climate zone maps that are being developed. And that's shown in the plot um, here where we can see um, that the um, graphics here is showing high resolution um, simulations of, of Sydney. Uh, over Sydney during the heat wave of 2017, and it's also able to not only integrate some of those variabilities in, in the cities, but also um, analyze the uh, mesoscale processes like sea breeze and, um, and um, flows at different scales that are affecting an event like heat wave. In this study, particularly, they were able to show that quantified not only the urban effect um, to accumulating heat, which is around 10 degrees, but also showing that even surrounding areas um, that are outside of the urban areas are affected by this heat accumulation due to the mesoscale processes. So having this now consolidating this knowledge then helps us um, to develop climate sensitive urban design and uh, climate sensing urban design and planning approaches. So in that case, we're looking at urban planning in terms of land use and, and our transfer set system coming down to more the design elements and the smaller um, factors like architecture elements and, and orientation. And then considering how some of these water and, um, and vegetation and other potentially nature-based solutions or um, engineered solutions can be used for um, creating climate sensitive cities to creating our cities more um, term termally comf comfortable and reducing the heat stress. Um, examples of these, these initiatives can be um, cool roofs, um, the cool walls, um, use of different reflective materials and vegetation. And you can see in this visualization, um, these can be very specific to to a certain climate and 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 um, certain uh, urban configuration. So, um, being able to integrate that into smaller scale modeling then also enables us to come up with um, solutions that are appropriate for certain climate and and um, an area that we are looking at. In addition to looking at the the um, impact of some cooling strategies, we can also um, use that some of the examples of research looking at not only what method to use, but also where to use it and how does that lead to impact. So this is a modeling approach that is uh, that has used the cool roofs as shown before, but this time focusing on um, Two diff a few different strategies. One is that you um, use cool roofs in the entire city, which is, I guess, ideal, but we know that it's not really feasible. And the other one is thinking about what if we only prioritize areas that are more heat sensitive, that are more vulnerable. And you can see that if the purple sign, which is like cool roof across the city, is, uh, is highest um, cooling achieved, but that's not that far from the, um, the red um, dark red, where we can see if we only focus even in the most sensitive areas, the majority of cooling is achieved, and that has implications in um, not only the temperature values, but also aspects of um, equity in our um, cities. As we know, and this is quite critical because we know that um, challenges like heat are not felt the same across the city, and in fact, like um, it, it can be quite um, variable based on socioeconomic status, demographics, and access to resources, or even in this case, an example of um, showing that the uh, race may even have a factor in the way that people are exposed to heat. So this then leads to combining the environmental uh, assessments that we've had before, or the LCD maps, that all of that we show that like we're focusing more on the, the urban factors and the environmental factor, and then combining that with the socioeconomic um, elements as well as demographics and coming up with vulnerability maps, um, such as the one that's shown here for Melbourne. These are vulner vulnerability maps um, for major Australian cities where they look at um, in high resolution, they look at neighborhoods that may have higher demographics of um, people sensitive to heat for various reasons, from physiological to um, financial or like demographic um, aspects. So we talked about um, 
contribution research in, in climate resilience and in terms of like making our cities like the in terms of assessing vulnerability i also want to bring an example of climate resilience but this time in the context of um events that are happening so we something like a pa paris olympic um is going to attract a lot of people but it's is happening also in air, mostly urban areas and we know that first of all we're uh, experiencing a, a warmer climate and urban areas are, are, are hotter. So um, this research project, the research demonstration project led out of France in an international collaboration is then trying to address um, very specific scientific questions in regards to both modeling and um, measurements so that we create better um, now casting and forecasting of weather as well as the assessment of um, weather extremes and the impact they're likely to have in events such as Paris Olympic. So, so far I mentioned uh, factors that are related to quantifying like the, the way that the city is, the way that like our modeling that integrate that and then bringing in um, even socioeconomic aspects. I, um, I want to now move on to how the community has been then engaging people in the process of um, creating impact in also enabling our citizens in um, getting the information that is, um, that is going to help them um, or decide on some of the adaptive um, measures that they can take in addition to what, to what the city can offer. So this, for example, is a project, they said um, the, the citizen science project where um, had a, a, the objective of putting um, weather stations and air quality sensors in cities is called SWAC, um, school weather and air quality. And um, you see if we only focus on the, the um, uh, environmental aspects, we already see very, big disparity between the way that the, the temperature is felt across different um, schools. But in addition to just quantifying um, environmental parameters, this project also have engaged um, students and trying to understand how can we bring um, science of urban climate and like things that in our day-to-day -day, um, life is going to be critical for managing things like heat and air quality. Answering questions like how much do you know, what, how can we communicate the information to you and how can you access this um, so that you are better informed. And the reason this is, and these are some of the examples of the visualization that students have come up with where they um, then explain how the data can be presented so that it's better integrated in their work. And the reason that this is very critical is that if you just, if you're aware of um, the um, weather and climate city, you may know that this project was established like maybe 2018, 19, between now, uh, between then and now we've had um, severe heat waves, bushfires, flooding, COVID. So these students have gone through a lot of events where they could see on the, the, their day-to-day -day life how they can use um, the similar data to this and how it can um, influence some of their decision-making. And it's unfortunate, but these are means that are that they're also um, for the, and the ways that the education can also be um, combined with um, urban climate research. So this is just going from that visualization to the dashboard that has been developed that is fully based on that co-design workshops um, and the way that it's, everything is presented is through that direct engagement with the community. So I'm going to end by just showing a couple of slides of our um, International Association of Urban Climate and we try to focus on the contribution of our research field, but now I want to just briefly also introduce the association as well. So here, if you're interested in um, getting more information, the, the Twitter handle and the website. Um, a little bit of overview of the of the um, urban climate community or IAUC. It's quite a diverse uh, group of members currently, like valid members of over 1,300 from 79 nations um, that are um, also receiving constant communication through like trainings or the newsletter. This is an example of our June newsletter, um, as well as the conferences like regional and um, international conferences that exist. Um, in addition to that, the, as mentioned by um, Nigel, the IOC community has been very active in, in improving the visibility and impact of our discipline area through collaboration with international and, uh, and national organizations, as well as the engagement with the community. 
So um, just ending with this slide that shows that um, the next conference of the International Association of Urban Climate will be um, in Sydney. The next in-person conference will be in Sydney in 2023. Um, however, we do have an uh, uh, we have a virtual poster symposium planned for 2022. So for more information, please. Um, go to the website that is mentioned here, icuc11.unsw.edu.au. And um, we hope that we increase this engagement of, um, of multidisciplinary work of urban climate. So with that, I'm gonna end the presentation. Well, thanks Nigel for doing this talk with me. I hope that the, the very a quick overview of both the organization and also some of the research we've done in the field has, um, has been helpful and triggered some thoughts. So hopefully we get more engagement in the community and more research coming out as well.